Good morning, everyone. Humanity has always felt threatened by things that are outside of their control. The famous four horsemen of the apocalypse, war, famine, pestilence, and death, have followed them and have been the cause of the loss of a number of civilizations that may in many of our countries are now history. Now, in a more modern view, our good friend Kate O'Brien calls this world a Wuka world because it's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. But we go back to the same four horsemen of the apocalypse. We have conflict because of displacements, the issues of climate change, the issues of people living under very difficult conditions within cities, and, of course, a large number of outbreaks. When all of this happens, people become exposed to a number of things, especially environmental pathogens. And in areas where this happens yearly, or, or almost every year, then this causes a massive amount of problems for any public health specialist. If you look at this list, these are just the outbreaks of cholera reported during the first months of this year, from January to March of this year. And you can see that the list expands from the Americas with Haiti all the way to the Pacific with the Philippines. So this is a worldwide problem. Problem. We're not talking just about a number of countries that have had cholera outbreaks, but a massive issue around the world that requires a very different approach for its control. In places where you have surveillance and where you have an endemic situation like in Bangladesh, if you look at the hospital graphs of people coming to the cholera hospital that is run by the institution, you can see that Apart from the two years of the pandemic in which the curves were really flattened, we continue to see this twice biannual, this biannual type of curves of increasing in cases coming to the hospital with defined cholera. Now, cholera is a very simple disease. I don't know if any of you have had it or have been exposed to it, but it's just a massive diarrhea. Massive in the sense of putting yourself in a hospital and dying of dehydration. So in that sense, the, the, the organism that causes it is also quite simple. It's, it's a gram-negative rod in the shape of a coma that has a single flagellum. Now, the outside part of the envelope of um, the, the bacteria is what gives it its characteristics. And this uh, lipopolysaccharide-based major surface antigen has been classified in the laboratory into at least 206 serogroups. Of those, only two of them, O1 and O139, have been related to cholera cases. The other ones cause other types of infections, but they don't cause clinical cholera. Now, the same bacteria can be classified into two biotypes. And this relates to the type of movement the organism has had over time in the sense of adaptation to a number of things, and we call those classical and altor. And then the other classification we have of these two types of of, uh, of uh, lipopolysaccharides is a serotype that is divided into two, an Ogawa and an Inaba, and then one that is a combination of the two of them that we call Hikojima. This has importance because of the composition of all these antigens within the scope of the vaccines that we use. Now, in a sense, the bacteria was discovered many years ago by Robert Koch in Germany, and the famous paragraph that we have in history is how this man, who was an anesthesiologist living in London, studied a whole outbreak very close to where he was living, made a a wonderful map of how the cases were going, and finally found out that everything was related to a single pump supplying water to one of the areas of the city that he was able finally to close and stop the outbreak. Now, that didn't stop cholera in London. That took a long, long time in which the city stop overflowing all its sewage into the Thames River and created a massive system of tunnels to be able to take the sewage and put it somewhere else. That is what finished cholera, not the pump, 
and Broad Street. <clears throat> so in that sense, countries around the world, unfortunately, have invested in a different way. If this is Dhaka, and Dhaka has a massive transit problem, so people have been invested in making overpasses for the cars instead of underpasses for the sewage. And in that sense, instead of creating a sewage system that would make a difference to the health of the population and a supply of clean water, we continue to have, as you saw in the graph from the hospital, cases of cholera every single year. So when the floods come and the sewage comes up, then the people are exposed to the bacteria, and you go around the same vicious circle. When that happens, the most important thing is to be prepared, and that means to have all the facilities to treat every single patient that comes to your doors. And in that sense, the hospitals have to be clear, the beds have to be the appropriate ones, and then they get filled up, and if needed, this keeps growing, as it happens in, in Dhaka, in the sense of creating temporary facilities that have the facility the probability of housing people who come in. In 2017, we went from 100 patients per day to 1,000 patients per day in seven days. And that meant that we had to create a massive expansion of the hospital. And fortunately, if you look at the graphs, the mortality didn't rise up. Everybody who got there still alive, left alive in that sense. So in that sense, the, the work of, of how to deal with the cholera has been set up. We have rehydration, first by IV fluids and then orally. And the issue is then, how do we move into a prevention system? Now, both Koch and this man in Spain, Jaime Ferran, developed vaccines very early on, in the 1800s. Uh, Koch is more known, and Ferran, like many other things that happen in the world, if you don't publish in English, you're temporarily forgotten from life. So... Ferran, who made a vaccine who was better than the one that Koch made, is very recognized in Spain, but very little known outside. So now you know that. So we have been using these this <coughs> inactivated vaccines for a very long time. The issue with them is that they have produced very little impact, but not everything has been lost. One of the main trials in DACA many years ago in the 70s used as a control vaccine tetanus toxin. And when people saw within the demographic surveillance system that has been established in this rural part of Bangladesh since the 1960s, what was the mortality in the two groups that had received these vaccines? They realized that the girls who had received the tetanus toxoid had a lot much less survival rate than the ones who had received the cholera one. This led the people to move back into the idea that had been said before that tetanus talks were prevented tetanus if it was given before or during pregnancy, but in a much wider way to really show the epidemiologic and the public health impact of this intervention, which was then later proven with a program in which every single girl was vaccinated early on in adolescence against tetanus toxoid, and you can see the drop totally in tetanus toxoid case, tetanus cases in the newborns in, in Bangladesh, in, in Matla, after the intervention. This all led to a number of publications that proved that the system worked and that it could be used as a public health tool. So not all was lost in the sense, and this is what I call serendipity at work in the sense. There are other examples that we could talk about if you're interested. Now, of the vaccines that were initially used, which were mainly inactivated, injected products, the new ones use the same type of bacteria that made the, the injected ones into oral preparations. <clears throat> the idea here was that you inactivated the bacteria and instead of injecting it, you would get a better response because you were giving them directly into the intestine, producing a, a much better local immune response based not on IgG but on IgA, <clears throat> and that that would create a protection system that would last longer and be more effective. And in that sense, you can see that both Inaba and Ogawa strains were part of these new vaccines. 
apart from using also the beast of unit of the cholera toxin, which everybody thought was also antigenic. This is a group of people who tested the first vaccine developed in Sweden by Anne-Marie Svenerholm and Jan Holmgren, uh, which was called Ducoral, and it was an oral vaccine based on these things that had the only problem um, that needed a full glass of buffer to be given before you took the vaccine to inactivate the gastric acid in the stomach, and that, of course, made it very difficult to give to any child below the age of 10, because having a whole glass of something that they had to drink was not easy. John Clemens, that you can see over there, and Mr. Prodan, who's still in Bangladesh, were the ones who led with this very small group of people the first impressive uh, phase three trial to test uh, Ducoral in Bangladesh during the 80s. And what they found was amazing. If you look at the impact of the uh, beast of unit of the cholera toxin as part of the vaccine, in the first six months, the vaccine effectiveness, of course, was clearly in favor of the presence of the, of the antitoxin than to just the, 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 the killed bacteria. But as the time passed on, at three years, there was really no difference between the two vaccines. So that is why the new pro, uh, formulation of the new, of the vaccines we have currently do not include the beast of unit of the cholera toxin, but relate only to the amount of bacteria that are part of, of this thing. The other thing that Clemens demonstrated was that if you vaccinated enough people in a village against cholera with this vaccine, you could have an impact in the non-vaccinated population due to a herd immunity effect. Now, that can only be done where you have a demographic surveillance system. That means where you have the denominators that allow you to compare the two groups. And as you can see in the graph, it comes a moment when the two, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, have the same rates because of the numbers of people involved in both groups. So this is the first demonstration that if you vaccinate enough people, you're able then to protect the unvaccinated. This is what the COVID vaccines never got to do, although everybody from Tony Fauci down th thought that we might ever, ever get to this type of herd immunity process. What are the current vaccines? Well, we have, of course, Ducoral that has been pre-qualified by WHO. That means it can be bought by UNICEF and Gavi, uh, the Pajo Revolving Fund, if, if that's for the Americas. Uh, and then you have other products that have not gone through this pre-qualification product that we know about because there have been publications, but they have never been really part of our public health arsenal. And the second one you have is a modification of the same vaccines, both produced by Shankol, which is a subsidiary of Sanofi now, and by uh, U-Biologics in Korea, which is a company that has not only done the same vaccine, but modified the presentation to make it much easier for use. Shankol, the original vaccine, used glass vials, which were very difficult to open because they were really like things to use for syringes. And a lot of people got their fingers burned and, and, and cut because of that. And what uh, the people in, in Ubiologics did was to put the vaccine into little plastic vials that you can then just squeeze into the mouth of people and vaccinate them in a much easier way. It is also thermostable, and it is also something that you can use to actually do uh, self-administration um, if needed. And we have done that in, in a number of places where you cannot really go back for the second dose that is needed. So you give the people the second dose and you ask them to take it themselves in a few weeks. Um, there are other uh, vaccines related to the same ones, which carry the same patent. They're the one produced in Vietnam. And Colvax, which is uh, the same in, uh, vaccine produced in Bangladesh by Incepta a pharmaceutical company there, with the problem that Bangladesh doesn't have 
a regulatory authority that is uh, WHO approved at the level enough to be able to export those vaccines outside of the country. They're finally, after 20 years, getting to that point, and we hope that that will make a huge difference for the supply of the vaccine in the future. Now, what are the new products that we have online? Well, unfortunately, Shankol is not produced anymore. A decision made by Sanofi some months ago uh, put it out of the market. So the only vaccine we have currently available as part of the stockpile that is used to control outbreaks is Ubicol, uh, in that sense. Now, Ubicol, of course, has the composition of the old Shankol. And what the company has decided to do now and test is to simplify it. That means reduce the number of strains that are used to make this vaccine from four, five uh, to two, and then to make a formulation that is far easier to be able to prepare. This will reduce the cost, increase the amount of production of the vaccine, and be able to make it more available in the near future since we only have this vaccine available for now. The vaccine has been already tested in Nepal uh, by, by, by the, the, the company to show that it has the same efficacy and the same safety as the vaccine that has more, more components. And we feel that this is going to be a huge uh, way of helping out with the production of the needed company. Ducoral has been in the process of, of retooling how it's done to get rid of the buffer. And what they have done in Sweden now is to actually make the whole preparation into capsules that do not need to have the buffer taken. Just take them by mouth and they go directly to the intestine. This is something that we talked about about 20 years ago. David Sack was an old friend and an old hand in the cholera world they always said that you had to lyophilize the product and just put it in some milk and give it to the children. And I think this is what is being done. Now, this new preparation of, of, uh, of Ducoral has been proven, if you see the central part, to be as safe and effective as the old preparation with the buffer and as the uh, preparation of Ubicol, which is really the same kind of composition without the B subunit that the, 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 this vaccine continues to have. Um, there are other products in, in the pipeline. Uh, the Hillman Laboratories in India have produced a vaccine based on these uh, uh, strains that uh, uh, express both the Inaba and the Ogawa antigens. They have used the Higojima strain to produce their vaccine. And it has gone through the first five phases showing that it's safe and effective. And now they're doing a phase three trial that I think was delayed for the start because of the pandemic, but I think it's on the way. And this is also going to be a new added uh, uh, tool to the arsenal we have. And then we have uh, Matthew Walder, who used the strain that was isolated in Haiti to produce a, 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 a vaccine that is based really on a, a live vaccine that has been inactivated. This is nothing new. In fact, the only patented vaccine approved by FDA for use in the United States is the old Mike Levine HCD4103 HER, which is really the same thing. It's a, a live vaccine that has been modified so that it doesn't produce any problems that can be given orally. The problem with that vaccine is that it's extremely expensive. It is geared mainly towards tourists and, of course, invited or uninvited. And the invited ones are the tourists. The uninvited ones are normally the armies that go and do their work in places where they're sometimes not invited. And so in that sense, that is a vaccine that is already in use. And this would be an added one that could be part of the, of the public health arsenal. And finally, and funnily enough, we're going back to the injected ones. After all the experience we have had with the oral vaccine, it is clear that we have two problems. One, there's no response to these vaccines in children under five years of age. The response is very little. And as cholera progresses from outbreaks to endemic situation, the children instead of the adults are the ones that start getting infected. So if you don't have a vaccine for them, you're losing the protection that you need in the long run. 
The second thing is that you need a vaccine that will give you a good T cell response that will be able to survive for years, which the oral vaccines do not do. And the third thing is to be able to incorporate the vaccine into the EPI system. It will be very hard to think that you could actually use an oral vaccine at that age that's going to have to have multiple doses in life to be able to come finally to a protection in later life. So all of this has made a group, the group in, in Harvard led by Ed Ryan and the group in Bangladesh led by Fidoz Kadri to test this new vaccine, which is mainly based on the external antigens, the O antigen of, of the Vibrio cholera in that sense. So this has already been passing through the safety part. This has already been done in a phase one trial, and this is already moving into phase two and three trials for which we will have results soon that will enable us to see we can move back into this type of vaccines for the control of cholera in the long run. Now, as you will know, we have a system of stockpiles that is run um, by a special group. And currently we have a problem looking at the number of outbreaks we have and the supply of vaccine that we have. Therefore, because of the need to curb the outbreaks, the decision was made based on a SAGE recommendation to use a single dose of the vaccine to control the outbreak and then go back when the supply is uh, more plentiful to be able to give a second dose to the same population. The international coordinating group that looks into this is, is a group that includes a number of organizations that are the ones that control the stockpile, not just for cholera, for Ebola, and for other, other vaccines. Now, the idea here is that from the moment that the country makes a request to the moment that the campaign starts, there should be no more than 28 days. And this has been really an effort to make sure that we don't, uh, or we try to help with the curve of an outbreak as soon as we know that it, it has been confirmed. In that sense, I think that the, the system has become more and more efficient and the vaccines have been arriving more and more on time where, where they are needed. If you can see the, the number of the list here, it's, it's incredible that, um, the, the number of places and the number of people that are vaccinated yearly with these products is increasing exponentially. Now, vaccines alone, as we have seen with the case in London, um, are not going to be enough to control the problem. Now, there has been a, a global task force for the control of cholera for a long time in WHO, and they have a whole program that would end at the end of this decade. The idea here is that we need an early detection and an early response of the outbreaks, the targeting of who is really exposed, and then an effective coordination mechanism to be able to have everything in place to control the problem. The other thing is that we need to detect where the problem is happening. And in, even in a small country like Bangladesh, you have certain places where you have a constant transmission of cholera and other places where you don't have the problem. So detecting the hotspots is an essential part of deciding which is the, the, the group of people that requires the interventions and especially the vaccination that's going to happen. And the other is to create a special or a, or a basic wash package. And if you look through it, it's really basic. I mean, to think that you are going to have a small latrine in a place and a little bit of water supply, and that's going to do the trick, is really um, aspirational, wishful thinking. If you really need to this to happen, it's going to have to be more than that. But to start, at least, you're thinking of making it clear to the population that the way that you, they dispose of the waste and the way that they protect their hands, especially, are essential for the control of these diseases, giving them an idea in some places that bacteria exist because these people are pre-bacterial in many ways in their thinking of how these diseases are spreading. The idea then from studies that have been done, especially with the hand-washing part and the use of soap, and the community engagement 
in the process of doing all these things, I think starts helping that. NGOs around the world have a system. There's a beautiful one in which you twin your bathroom in your house with a latrine somewhere else that you pay for as part of the twinning, and then you get a little picture that you put in your bathroom that says, this bathroom is twinned to that. I started doing it with my American and Canadian friends in Puerto Vallarta, and it has been a huge success. So every time you go to their homes, you can see that they've been paying for latrines in the Philippines, in Africa, and in other places. And I thought that was a way of channeling some funds to some projects that really look worthwhile in that sense. They might not finish the problem, but at least people are aware of that there's a need to give and there's a need to receive. The other thing is that we have a way of progressing the system. One is, of course, the first part is to make sure that we have the treatment centers so that people don't die when they get sick. You have the cholera kits that are essential for that, and you have the emergency, at least, wash elements that you need, a supply of fresh water when the floods come out and everything is lost. The second part, really, is the use of the oral vaccines plus the wash, and eventually the long-term wash, which means having a sewage system and a clean water supply for the big city especially, and then for the slums to move from what they have now into a system that is far healthier. This will, of course, make a huge difference. And if you look at the whole spectrum of the SDGs, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, and you see, as was done in this uh, recent paper, by this group led led by by David Bloom and, and Reno Rapoli, you can see that vaccines actually fit into almost every single one of the SDGs. I think the only ones that are left out are uh, the fish and the uh, the, uh, um, uh, the clean energy, for which we still don't have vaccines, but I think people are working on them. And in that sense, you have a vaccine that can be used or is part of every single one of these interventions. The main thing is that if we want to achieve these SDGs, if you add the vaccines, the curve is much faster and more higher than if you don't use them. So we have in our hands a wonderful tool that now needs to be used together with other things. You just heard Mary Hamill talk about malaria, and they have the bed nets, the treatment, uh, etc. So the vaccines by themselves don't do it. Even when we vaccinate infants, if we don't breastfeed them, if we don't protect them, then the vaccines alone do not make the trick. So this has to be a more concerted effort and move towards a much better system of primary care, which eventually is how we're all going to have a better system of care in our own countries and in our own way of saving lives in, in a different way. I'd like to thank the people who actually work on this. I call them and they were kind enough to lend me their slides so that you would have information that I didn't interpret but was actually from the horse's mouth. And these are prime examples of uh, horses that win races. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Gabriel. So, question here. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, I have um, two related questions. One is, do you see a role, assuming supply allows for it, of um, more routine or, or preventative vaccination with the cholera vaccine? And can you say more about what happened with the live vaccine? Because I think it was useful in, in smaller children, but you said it's expensive and it's not really available. And I wonder if, if there's any effort to bring that back. The, the first question, yes. In fact, uh, Fidasi Kadri, who I think is going to be here tomorrow, she has been leading a, a, a trial looking at the endemic use of the vaccines in a place like Bangladesh. And that was the idea to transfer the technology to Incepta so that there would be a supply, local supply of vaccine in huge quantity to be able to tackle the amount of numbers that you have. The idea here is to demonstrate 
that you can use the vaccine constantly and that will reduce the endemicity even if you're not tackling the other problems. So, yes, the movement is going there. The problem is that the rest of the world is not in that position, but the data that will come out of those studies will be essential to see how we can use these vaccines in endemic situations and not just the epidemic ones. With the oral vaccines, I think the, the issue with the vaccine that, that Mike uh, developed and tested, Jim Caper and others in his group, was that the the way the vaccine is produced and everything else is not something accessible in price, cost, and, and availability. But it's a wonderful vaccine. There's no doubt about it. The problem is that you're given a live attend. People are still afraid of that, although the mutations that it has make it highly unlikely that it will revert to being pathogenic. It's an old strain. Now, Mike Walder, with his study, says that he has a new strain, and, and that was laughable because his strain is probably as old as the other one. He was isolated more recently, but it doesn't mean that the strain wasn't there for a long time because it was isolated in Haiti. Now, if you look at the way we have studied this transmission of cholera in waves, these this strains have been coming and going for years. So in that sense, what we need to demonstrate with this new oral vaccine that is in development is what is the public health use of that? Convincing a company to change its whole marketing way and moving into that is almost impossible. So for now, the vaccine in, in use in the U.S. is very restricted to those groups that I have said, and nobody has thought about using it or is the interest of the company to do it. So, But it doesn't mean that this could also be a way of, of trying to tackle some of the problems. Now, if you ask me to compare these oral vaccines, live attenuated ones, with injected ones, I would say that the injected ones have a much better future as part of the EPI system than these other ones. Uh, thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. And uh, it is uh, just, a, just a comment, actually, sir. Uh, like we have seen the role of vaccine, and you also mentioned the role of WASH. But I also think the role of ORS is also very important uh, in case of any kind of diarrheal diseases because in our country, we do promote a lot on ORS and uh, we we really do lots of health education and everything on ORS. So what's your take on that? Sir? Well, in fact, the if you look at, I, I have a little video that I didn't use, but it's a patient coming into the hospital uh, in the when I was there. And it's, it, you start with the IV because the patient is, is completely unconscious sometimes and you, you can feel a pulse, but you, you, it, it's about a person on the brink of death. So you have to really put water in fast to be able to recover that. Once the patient is conscious, we move into oral rehydration and that's the old one, the old system. And if you go to the hospital in Dhaka, they have this kitchen where they prepare the ORS. And that's what they distribute to everybody. And that's what people take home when they leave the hospital once they, they are able to, to, to move on. So in that sense, we, we recommend that. And in difference to many other parts of the world, because Bangladesh was really involved with the discovery and the use of these, the, the ORS use at home in, in places there is amazing compared to other parts of the world because it's, it's something established. Uh, like the use of zinc tablets, which is the other thing that has been also tested there. So I don't disagree. I, I think that's an essential component. Now, for many other countries where uh, diarrhea is not endemic anymore and you have the outbreaks, then, of course, when the outbreaks happen and you have people in hospital, once they are recovered, then you move from injected to oral rehydration to be able to complete the task. There's no question about that in, in that sense. Um, thank you for your talk. This is Ia from Guinea. So um, I just want to support the way I'm here. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, the argument about WASH. Um, I'm coming from Guinea. So since 2017, we used to have like periodic um, outbreak, cholera outbreaks up to 2012. However, um, surprisingly, since the Ebola outbreak in 2013, 2016, we've not yet had any 
um, outbreak of cholera. Um, there is no uh, evidence that it might be related to um, the WASH Act intervention, but we think that that's uh, a relation between um, those activities, those interventions that were made during the outbreak, Ebola, and the lack of um, cholera outbreak. So have I, you seen that in other countries? He, yes, we saw that in Latin America. In, in Latin America, when, when we had the, the cholera outbreak started in Peru in the 90s, um, it, it, in a very short time, it was all the way up to Mexico. So it had spanned the whole continent in, in a very short time. And of course, the first thing that um, was offered um, was vaccines. I mean, uh, both uh, Jan Holgem and, and Mike Levine were in Mexico talking to the Minister of Health, offering their vaccines. And we had a big discussion among the people who were in infectious diseases with the ministry about what the intervention should be. And the consensus was that we had to improve the water and sanitation, especially of the big cities, especially of Mexico City, instead of buying these vaccines. And that's what the government did. So for the next 10 years, there was a massive improvement on, on sanitation, sewage, and everything else. <clears throat> the sanitation went back to the Aztecs. And I'm not joking. If you go down to Mexico and you see how the Aztecs uh, got rid of their disposal, that was far far more uh, well done than what the Spanish did and what Mexico did for many years. So in that sense, that really dropped the number of diarrheas. But you know what really pinned it down? The introduction of rotavirus vaccine. And if you look at a, a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine by the group in Mexico who led the vaccination, you can see that every year the, the curves drop until they disappear. And that was really the impact of the rotavirus vaccine. Now, rotavirus are not uh, transmitted by water. Rotavirus are transmitted like shigellas by dirty hands. So that is where the wash part of washing hands has a huge impact. Uh, so in that sense, if you control the sewage and everything else, you control the, 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 the infections that have a high dose, ETEC and cholera. But if you want really to go into the ones that are transmitted person to person, that is where the hand washing becomes essential. So that is where the progression of controlling the environment and then having a better system in-house to be able to have a sanitation, a personal hygiene is what makes the difference. And if you look at outbreaks of, of rotavirus disease in Texas for many years before there was rotavirus vaccination, in, in um, places where you had small children in daycare centers, it was a massive problem because there was an internal transmission because of the hand washing situation, just as hospital infections. So in that sense, the, the, the whole process has steps. And I think the first one is really an environmental intervention to be able to do it, but then it has to come down into that. If you look at the studies of the GEMS trial and you see the difference in the pathogens isolated in Africa and the ones isolated in Bangladesh at the same time, you can see the big difference in the environmental protection offered in one place and another in the type of pathogens. And you have a massive amount of Shigellas and rotavirus in Bangladesh that you don't see in the African sites. So all of this has a relationship that we know now. And that is why you have to have this basic package that includes at the end hand washing stations in the home. Otherwise, you don't have the last part to be able to protect the people. Okay. Upstairs. Yeah. Thanks, Alejandro, for that great talk. I'm curious about to learn about or uh, where your thoughts are around diagnos diagnosis of cholera. What I understand is there's no actually specific rapid diagnostic test that prevents, I guess, how it links in with an outbreak response immunization and how the reliance on that or what the progress on that. Might the be. only thing that you can really confuse cholera with is a very severe e tick diarrhea. And both of them more or less move in the same way. And and to be honest, <laughs> you don't really need a diagnosis to treat the patients. And uh, now the other, if, if if you have an outbreak, yes, then you have to demonstrate that it's cholera to get the vaccine from the ICA. Th that I agree. But in the sense of treatment, I think the idea is just to have the capacity to be able to move fast into preventing death from from a very severe diarrhea. 
The issue in difference with ETEC in cholera is that you have very little vomiting. That's something that happens when people are recovering. When you start giving them IV fluids, the first thing they do is to vomit, um, which doesn't happen with ETEC, in which you really have a lot more vomiting during the acute phase of the, of the problem. But uh, the rest of the other pathogens, really, um, give a very different uh, clinical perspective, so you, you you wouldn't need to confuse that in in that sense. Uh, but for the for the ac- access to the vaccines, yes, you, you need to co- confirm that you have cholera cases, and that is something that is required before you are able to ask for the vaccine from the stockpile. Great, hi, thanks for uh, the really nice talk. This is Tanya from the UK. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment on um, or what you see as the how OCV, the current vaccine, should be deployed in somewhere like Bangladesh. Right now, there's um, there's a national control plan, and it's a plan, it's a plan on paper, uh, where they are sort of thinking that they would need upwards of 60 million doses a year. Um, and so, how, you know, what would you do? How would you, would you prioritize? What do you think yeah. the role of vaccines are in a place like Bangladesh? My, my personal view has always been that Bangladesh has been very delayed in incorporating rotavirus vaccination to that. If you look at the, the, at the, the not just um, Matlab or Dhaka, but all the five, six sites uh, that DICDRB has, you have a, a huge amount of rotavirus diarrhea that comes up at the end of the year, October and things, and most all the way till March. That is, and the delay really for a country that has a, a wonderful uh, EPI system has really been, to my knowledge, something that has been delayed for other reasons. Now, now it was the COVID, now it was this, now it's the HPV. But I think that would really make a huge difference to especially infant and, and, and young children's diarrhea. Cholera, in a sense, if you look at the number of people under five with cholera, it's always been a lot less than older adults, and especially in, in the hospital. So in that sense, what you're trying to do here with the endemicity is to block a bit the lack of a good sanitation program. So in that sense, my opinion is that the huge investment in vaccinating hundreds of millions of people against cholera uh, with two doses and uh, repeated every three years, instead of actually using that money to create the sewage system in DACA that will last uh, for a longer time, I think it's it's a bad choice investment. But that is my opinion, and I have no, <laughs> if, no, no reason now to be able to influence what, what is going to be decided. But I don't sincerely think that just by vaccinating the adults all the way down to whatever age you want, it's going to make the biggest difference when you don't have a change in the environment in that sense. Great. One last question, Pamela. Thank you, Pamela from Cameroon. Um, we usually have cholera in my country around a certain period. And we, the area is called the cholera belt. It usually comes from that particular area every year, every time. So I wanted to know, are there any reasons why this happens? Those are the hotspots that we talked about. But the funny part is that you don't consider that you have an endemic problem in Cameroon. No, no, cholera is just a yearly outbreak. Yeah, but it's a yearly outbreak for many, many years. So in that sense, it's the, it's the same as if you were living in, in Dhaka with, with a yearly part. So it, I think that the, 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 the nomenclature here is wrong. Because if you haven't had a problem with the war in Sudan now, what is the, the expected? That you're going to have a massive cholera outbreak because you've been having cholera outbreaks in South Sudan for the past 10 years in that sense. So the bacteria is circulating there. There's no doubt about that. And it lasts for a long time in the environment because that's where it likes to live. The bacteria doesn't like the intestine. Once it gets out of its comfort zone, then it has to defend itself against a lot of people living in the same environment. And that is why they get close to the mucosa and they produce the toxin. And what the toxin does is produce a massive amount of oxygen that kills all the anaerobic bacteria in the intestine and allows them to be the only ones in the, in the, in the, in the neighborhood. 
That is why they do it. And it's an amazing thing when you look at it because it's a whole system. But it's it's because the bacteria needs to find a way to survive in an environment that is not friendly. Once it's in the water, in the Bay of Bengal or around Haiti, it can last there for centuries without any problem and might not even cause an issue. So here the problem is that it's more convenient for the people to say we have a yearly program than we have an endemic situation because we have an area in which transmission of cholera is continuous. And it just relates to the environment in certain temperatures, in certain ways, that the system starts again and the people get infected again. And you have a new population that is not immune that is going to now be sick. So in that sense, there's the nomination of outbreaks in places where you have a yearly type of problem is, in my opinion, a wrong way of looking at the epidemiology and a long way to tackle uh, to tackle. Because you have now where they are, and that is a population that you would target either for an intervention of vaccination or to see where the source of the cholera problem is and tackle that through some kind of environmental uh, changes. So, uh, but and it's not just Cameroon. I think it's, it's many places. Haiti has been having a cholera outbreak since the Nepalese soldiers brought it during the earthquake, and it hasn't moved there because of the conditions of Haiti, not because of anything else. And they have not been able, and the vaccine, and the, the, most of the population has already been vaccinated, and that hasn't stopped the outbreaks happening every year. 